This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. So I'm really, really happy to be here tonight. We're going to talk about a, a few different things related to new energy and also about how important it is to consider uh, uh, two different factors that weigh heavily in us making this happen. And, and by us, I mean all of us here, not just some people who have a, a business card that says new energy movement on it. But you know, a, th a few things I will be stressing are the value of relationships and making an endeavor like this come about. And the other is, is the concept that, that ideas are strengthened as they're shared. Ideas are strengthened as they're shared. It's such a, a powerful theme that certainly flows, continues to flow through what we're trying to do. And I think it'll become real evident to you as we go along here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, so what are we going to be talking about tonight? The path to breakthrough new energy technologies, a, a grassroots movement. We'll be talking about some new energy legislation and also something I really want to focus on, which is the appeal of the open sourcing concept for new energy technologies. Uh, for those of you who were coming in, uh, right, uh, maybe about 10 minutes ago, you maybe have heard a song being played. And that song was a theme song for New Energy Movement that was written by this musical artist, Sean Galloway. Uh, Sean is, is one of the guys who personifies this relationship and the value of people coming together spontaneously to contribute their talents. So we, we uh, met one day. I heard a, a, an incredible song that he'd come up with. Uh, and I, I thought, wow, this is, this is great stuff. And I invited him to come be the musical artist at our first conference and he was really excited about that so that that went off great Sean later later took a signature song that he'd done and made it into a music video that we're gonna play at the break because it has a lot to do with the spirit of how we've come together to make this thing happen and how we're going to make this thing come to fruition uh, over the, the coming years so uh, thank you Sean for for your contributions you know, we're, we're all aware, certainly anyone who's here and attends any events at, at this particular library, we all are dialed in to a lot of the drama that's going on on our planet right now, uh, certainly from an, a, an environmental perspective, from a geopolitical perspective, from the socioeconomic aspect, and even, I guess you could say, uh, uh, differences of philosophy. Uh, you know, religious or otherwise. There's a lot of challenges, big picture things that we're faced with right now. And we, we have to consider, you know, what's, what are going to be our approaches? None of us can do all of this. It's such a big bag. But we can choose to focus on certain areas that have great personal appeal to us or where we have, have talents that we can apply to, to one of those particular aspects. Ours and, and my group of colleagues is on leveraging the breakthrough new energy technologies and a whole new era that will come about when these things are released. And that, that time's going to be soon, I'm, I'm convinced of that. We don't really have a lot of time to wait on this either. You know, we, we uh, have a large network of, of folks in the science community, the inventor community, uh, colleagues who are throughout the, the environmental uh, climate change uh, community as well. And I'll give you a, a little vignette. Uh, in September of 2006, a new energy movement was privileged to co-host a conference on future energy in Washington, D.C. with Integrity Research Institute, which is an organization that's run by Dr. Tom Vallone. Uh, Tom happens to be on our board of directors as well. And Tom puts on an excellent conference. It's mostly geared toward 
toward the, the real science community, and the audience there was filled with physicists, engineers, pretty much hard science. It, it was not geared toward the mainstream public like the way new energy movement is. We, you know, I want to talk to, to uh, the lay community here. You don't have to, to have a PhD in anything, even a master's, to, to hear what we're talking about. But Tom gears toward the hard science. So one of the speakers that he had there was the chief science officer from the NASA Langley facility. Uh, his name's Dr. Dennis Bushnell. And Dennis was one of the early presenters in this conference. And he was talking about what his views were on the need for, for new energy technologies and what type of technologies he would favor. And, and Dennis heavily focused on this concept. If we were to grow salt-tolerant species of vegetation in all the world's deserts and irrigate them with seawater, we could grow enough vegetative mass to make into biofuels and maybe we can use that. Maybe we can use that to make a dent in, in our fossil fuel situation and climate change. Well, this was a very sophisticated audience. And after he was done, very first question was, was well, Dr. Bushnell, uh, what if your measure is, is too little too late? And Dennis hesitated for a moment, then he said, well, my colleagues and I have considered detonating a supervolcano so that we could put enough particulate matter in the atmosphere to cause a solar shield. <laughs> and and, and the, the audience, you could hear the like, you know, the gasp around the audience. And he realized then, like, um, you know, probably shouldn't have said that. But, you know, it's on record that, that this was a comment that he made. And now my first thought was, not surprised. I'm not surprised at this. And uh, the other, then, then my second thought was, of course, how many of us would hear about that before they did that, right? <laughs> Detonating a supervolcano. I mean, to me, that, that, just, that just shows the near absurdity of what's going on in our political system and, and how do we really address these huge, huge issues for our planet. So anyway, I, I, I just mentioned that to you because, you know, these things are taken very seriously. I had a chance to hear uh, Dr. James Hansen from NASA, who's, who's considered one of the, the top climatologists on the planet. And you know Dr. Hansen because he's the one who, who claimed to have a lot of his, his data suppressed by the current administration. And uh, he gave a very, very uh, compelling presentation in Dallas in last October. And it was a real privilege to hear him speak firsthand. But, but again, uh, his emphasis was if we do not have a very, very significant uh, program to address climate change and, and carbon dioxide levels within 10 years, and not just on the drawing board, but already in the implementation stage, all bets are off. And, we're pro and he says, I tend to be a pessimist, and we're probably looking at mass extinctions, including the ones sitting in the room here. So he's not really optimistic. All right. Well, I am. Okay. I, how many of you are parents or grandparents? Okay. A whole lot of us here. So, you know, we've got great reason to be optimistic because we're not going to stand around or sit around and let, let other people uh, make non-decisions or, or make poor choices of what to implement when we can really bring something highly leveraged out. So I'm an optimist. I, I really feel strongly that, that we're going to do what's, what needs to be done. And, and I appreciate all of you being here to share that. Let's take a look at what, uh, what we have as far as an energy portfolio pie right now here in the United States. If, if, you, if you look at uh, what the sources of our whole energy picture, not just electricity, but also for fuel, uh, you, you'll find that it's broken down this way. We've got fossil fuels represented by petroleum, natural gas, and coal, which add up to 86% of the, the, uh, the, the generation fuel for our whole energy pie. And we've got nuclear power here is another 8%, and then a very thin slice of that pie is from renewables. 
Most of those renewables currently are coming from hydropower, which certainly here in the, the Northwest, and I live in Portland, you know, our, our power comes largely from all the dams that are along the Columbia drainage. Then the other, the other big part here is biomass. Biomass would include biofuels like, like ethanol, and biodiesel, those type of things. But, but biofuels really aren't but a tiny, tiny bit of that. Most of the biomass that's represented here comes from the, the industrial combustion of waste products from the pulp and paper industry or from the chemical industry. And I came out of both of those industries. I had a 20-some a, a year career as a consultant to the chemical and, and pulp and paper industries in North and South America. So I'm very familiar with, with big industries' role in, in energy and also in a lot of the uh, not so pleasant consequences of our, of our uh, consumer appetite for these industrial products. Uh, I'm not going to go into that because uh, deforestation is something that, that hits me heavy. Um, we might touch on that a little later. Anyway, uh, solar here, tiny, tiny little slice. Wind, tiny, tiny little slice. So that's our energy pie right now, 86% fossil fuels. Well, the Department of Energy has an agency that does its projections and statistics, and it's called the Energy Information Administration, the EIA. And the EIA makes a projection for the Department of Energy, one of which is a 25-year projection. So this past December, in 2006, they made their projection for the year 2030. What will be the portfolio for the energy generation in the United States 25 years from now? Guess how much fossil fuel will be a, a part of that pie? 86% exactly the same as what it is right now. <clears throat> the, the other thing, fossil, of, of the fossil fuels, right now oil is 40%, coal's about 25%. That balance will shift toward more coal rather than oil. And, and <laughs> clean coal, not likely. It's, it's not clean. The other thing is that uh, the, this renewable slice, which you would intuitively think, oh my God, you know, 25 years from now, we will have uh, renewables being the dominant part of the, of the energy pie. But that's not the case right now because with, with the, the wind and solar and biofuels that are, that are largely expected to, to gain momentum during that time, we have such a huge baseload requirement for, for new energy that these, these technologies of solar and wind and biofuels will barely be able to keep up with the new demand that starts now without addressing any of the existing demand from our 300 million U.S. citizens right now. So it's a huge, huge game of catch up that won't, that simply will not add up when you look at the energy math and the time frame that the climatologists say we have. It, it doesn't add up. So this should be, you know, front page news every day until it gets fixed. So the message here is renewables definitely are important, but it, they are woefully inadequate, both in the, the type, the amount that they can contribute to our generating capacity, and the way policy is being directed toward, toward their share of this pie. I didn't even talk about nuclear here, but I think most of you probably know where, where that's going. There's, there's a push behind new nuclear power plants here in the United States as well, even though we still have not solved what to do with the, the waste. I think it's a, it's a bad decision. It's, there's, there's other ways we can go and take this, and there's a, a lot better places to put all those tens and hundreds of billions of dollars, and we'll be talking more about that in a minute. Uh, Dr. Brian O'Leary is the visionary behind new energy movement. Uh, Brian O'Leary is, uh, he was in the, uh, recruited into the Apollo program uh, in, the, uh, in the 1960s, and he was uh, to be uh, part of the first manned mission to Mars. And then with the, 
a lot of the gyrations around uh, Vietnam and Watergate, uh, much of those programs got cut back. So, so Brian left the NASA program, went on to, to lecture, and then uh, had uh, the desire to start to explore a lot of alternative science based on, on him uh, you know, catching uh, little bits and pieces of some really compelling data that were coming out on uh, uh, various types of, of new energy technologies and some other, some other interesting uh, scientific anomalies. So Brian went around, started to visit these inventors all around the world, did this for, for quite a few years, uh, wrote a number of books about it, and lectured widely about it. But what he, what he found was that uh, compared to when he had audiences that were uh, attending his, his NASA astronaut-related lectures, and then comparing that to when he started to delve into the new energy scene, it was essentially like he had been blackballed. He no longer was getting television interviews, mass media interviews. Uh, audience size was, was way, way down. He was now being ridiculed uh, by the mainstream academic com community and was basically finding that there's a, a big curtain drawn around this, this whole topic. But he felt compelled to pursue this because he personally felt convicted that there's something here. There's a lot of smoke he was able to see personally. He knew that there's some real fire behind this. There's, there are real developments that could be brought out into the public domain. So together with, uh, with Alden Bryant and uh, Howard Jetter, uh, the three of them got together and hatched this idea of this grassroots public uh, nonprofit organization called the New Energy Movement. And uh, Alden Bryant had, has really good credentials for that because he, he heads up a, another organization called Earth Regeneration Society, which focuses on uh, restoration of forests, uh, the remineralization of our soils, and also uh, climate change, specifically addressing the carbon dioxide issue. And uh, Alden had, had been a key figure behind the, the uh, UN initiatives that spawned first the Rio Climate Summit and then the, the Kyoto Accord. Uh, Howard Jetter, lifelong teacher, uh, both of these gentlemen, uh, World War II veterans, and just tremendous individuals. And I, I was very, very privileged when they, they approached me and asked me if I would come and, and be part of this original uh, board of directors uh, to get this thing off the ground. Yes, sir. Can I ask you a question? Just digress for a moment. If we could go back to that pie chart. Yes. Which of those uh, renewables has the most potential of growth and keeping up with the demand proportionately? Well, the, the question is, is on the, uh, the renewable portfolio, which of those technologies has, has the greatest opportunity for growth? I, my own personal opinion of these, it's solar. Uh, I think wind. I think wind will have a, a, a quick jump, and then it will it will tend to, to stagnate. But solar is having all kinds of developments. There's a lot of technology that's going to to refine the the solar field, and it has a very very bright future. Pardon the pun, but it's uh, it's something that we definitely support. Uh, but I want to make clear to you, and I'll emphasize it again later, that new energy movement is educating about breakthrough energy technologies that go beyond any of the conventional renewables. There are large constituencies, some of which you are represented in this room, who already have, are, are part of the, the commercial scene for these technologies, such as some of you I know are in the solar field. Maybe there's some of you here in the wind or bio a fuel field or, e or using such on your rooftops or in your vehicles. And that's wonderful. We fully support that. But as I had, had mentioned to some U.S. Senators recently and to their constituents, we have to guard against the, the illusion and the dangerous illusion that these conventional renewables are adequate to get us where we need to go and as fast as we need to get there because they won't. We need a quantum leap. 
We need a change, and we need it quickly. And we'll get into some of that here in just a little bit. So thank you for your question on that. These are important, but they are a bridge to where we need to get. So the new energy movement was, was birthed and had its first conference in, in September 2004. And what we have as our, our motto is, is this. We recognize that the single most highly leveraged opportunity for advancement towards solving complex global problems lies in a transformation in the way human civilization generates and utilizes energy. We feel if you were to pick one single physical aspect of the, the whole global drama, it is energy. And it, it, it touches everything. It touches lighting, heating, transportation, food production, uh, in, in industrialization, everything. Everything is tied to that. Wow. And it has, and has a, a, a very direct tie-in to our our geopolitical issues, including our military to a great degree, and where we project the force of the military force of this country it has a lot to do with the environmental issues, of course, and tensions uh, that, that re have really destabilized the planet. So this is where we are choosing to focus, and it has tentacles that reach out to all different areas. I'm an optimist and believe truly that, that solutions are on the near horizon that are truly breakthrough in nature. Um, many of you are familiar with who Nikola Tesla was, a tremendous pioneer, genius inventor, a, a real prodigy when it came to, to being able to uh, develop all different types of inventions or improve upon existing inventions. And he, he developed some really uh, tremendously compelling energy technologies, in, including the, the technology for wireless transmission of electricity that apparently was squashed by industrialists and banking interests in his day that wanted electricity to go through copper wires. And, you know, having wireless transmission of electricity was, went tremendously against that vested interest. So he was, he was suppressed. In fact, the story goes that, that when he died, that the, uh, you know, some government agencies went in, took all of his documents, and that even to this day, that many of those have not been recovered. So we may never know the whole Tesla story, but certainly he inspired a lot of people, and he's probably more popular today than he was in his own day. So what is New Energy Movement's role here? Well, our role is to educate the public and policy makers, the, the mainstream science community, and the media about the need for us to urgently and seriously support the, the funding for research and development of breakthrough energy technologies. And, and there's a number of different technologies that come under that class of breakthrough energy technology. Some of these you've heard about before, perhaps you've heard something called zero point energy. You know, what's that? Uh, don't ask me to explain it to you very easily. That's, that's not what I'm here to do. We'll let Tom Vallone at one of his, his, uh, uh, his hard science conferences doing that. But, but uh, I, I think suffice to say that the background fabric of space time that's through us and all around us is absolutely pulsing with a background energy field that is untapped and can be. And there have been proof of principle experiments and, and claims of some devices that can tap that and produce clean, limitless energy. And I believe that that is the case. Uh, some magnetic generators. Uh, there's, there's various uh, dozens and dozens of inventors who have, have been uh, experimenting with various magnetic arrays, either rotating platforms, a magnetic motor, if you will, and solid state platforms where there's, there's simply a novel switching mechanisms for, for new types of circuitry that will tap into this, either the magnetic field of the planet or somehow is coaxing some of this energy out of the zero point field and can, can convert that into usable electricity. That's tremendously exciting. And there's, there's lots of developments that are going on in that arena. 
uh, and some of the, the real cases of obstructionism have been laid against that crowd. I've met a number of the, the inventors who have who've worked in that field and several of the ones that, that are very brilliant inventors and who, who have had the real deal have had some really nasty things done to, to keep them out of the public domain. And uh, I think it's something that we need to, to face up to as citizens that all of us have had instances where we have allowed our own personal vested interest to suppress something that was in the best interest of the whole. We've all done that to some extent. I know I've, I've certainly done that at, at times in, in my life. Uh, and certainly uh, there are large, heavily moneyed, vested, vested interests that have uh, their hands in puppeteer positions uh, where they can really manipulate things on a large scale because of vested interests. And it's been done. And there has been, you know, financing blocked. There's been patents blocked. There's been uh, uh, threats of physical intimidation and such threats carried out for sure. Uh, I've met a number of the folks who've experienced all different levels of these things. And it's, uh, it's sobering. But this is what we have to face. This has happened. It does not need to continue to happen. And it need not dissuade any of us from moving ahead and doing what we think is, is the right thing and what's in the best interest of a planet. Another, another class of technologies here, advanced hydrogen processes. Uh, this might be along the lines of a water as fuel type of technology. There's been a lot of activity on, on the internet, the, the internet videos. Uh, uh, where you might see, uh, you know, what appears to be a, a car or a motor running on water uh, or, or uh, some product from the breakdown of water. Uh, those, those technologies have great promise as well. And I think that uh, there certainly have been some inventors who've made claims in that arena who've experienced some of the same type of obstructionist activities. What about utilizing thermal gradient differences in the ocean and tidal energies? Well, the, que the question was, what about using uh, uh, ocean, ocean gradients, a temperature gradient in oceans, and also tidal power? Well, these are, these are great ideas, and they, and they are being explored, and they're being embraced in, in projects that already have a, a commercial footprint. Uh, certainly, uh, using wave power, tidal power, uh, is there are projects underway that are even being uh, federally and state funded. Uh, so those things are, are moving ahead. Uh, for the, uh, uh, the ocean thermal energy conversion that you're talking about using the, the temperature gradient from the surface of the ocean to the, you know, deep down where it's much colder, uh, there's, there are commercial processes for tapping that source of energy as well. And those are large, large sources. And they are, they are essentially free energy sources that we should tap into. And we've, we fully support that as well. However, again, there's, uh, there are limits on what can be done with those type of energy systems. And it's, from our view, it's largely in this realm. We right now have an electric jail that we all, uh, most of us, are beholden to as far as our, our power distribution. We are, we are beholden to a facility in most cases where power is generated centrally at some location and that's using a, a horribly polluting fuel, whether it's fossil fuel or whether it's nuclear fuel. And then that, then that electricity is sent through our extensive grid system with huge waste of energy, generally about two thirds of the electricity that's generated at the plant. By the time it hits your socket, we've lost two thirds of it, huge waste and highly vulnerable, highly vulnerable to weather, to an automobile hitting a power pole, to uh, you know, intentional acts of sabotage, if, if that was to happen, to simply technological breakdown or wear and tear on the system. Those are very vulnerable systems. What, what we favor are technologies that will allow us to ultimately have a, a device that a homeowner 
will have in, in their own possession and ownership uh, that will allow them to, to generate all their power requirements, to have it be a, a mobile source they can take with them, they can go off the grid, and it will truly be decentralized power to the people. <laughs> so that's what, that's what we favor. Now these other things like you, you mentioned here and I elaborated on as far as title and, and things like this, uh, it's, those still largely require a very centralized grid system. But it's something we should be pursuing very, very quickly right now because of the, the climate issues. Thank you for that question. Th this is something I like to, uh, to say occasionally simply to make the point that we don't have to use all the oil. We don't have to use it all in order to jump into the next era. Okay? That's what, that's what this is about. So I don't tend to participate a whole lot in the you know, peak oil, you know, is, uh, are, do we have uh, abiotic oil? That is, the, who, who's heard that term, abiotic oil? Okay, you know, that, that simply means, well, perhaps oil is largely being generated by, by thermal processes and chemical conversions that are happening deep within the earth rather than actually have been from the decay and, and compression and polymerization of plants and animals that died millions of years ago. Well, you know, I'm, my background is chemistry. And I have strong opinions on this uh, that I won't go into, but the, uh, the long and short of it is, why are we having this debate? We don't want to use all the oil anyway. We need to move to something that's clean and that addresses the climate change, not, not the never-ending pursuit of, of fossil fuels. So there, there's an interesting quote here by uh, Schopenhauer that, that, that says, uh, truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, then it's accepted as being self-evident. Now, Arthur C. Clarke had his own twist on this. He said, well, first they laugh at it, then they criticize it, then they say, I invented it first. Okay, I, I think that's more the way it tends to go. There's some interesting things that, uh, that had been part of our original vision for new energy movement that have now come to fruition through some partnership organizations. And, and the most significant of these has been our desire to start a, a database of new energy technologies that was publicly viewable and on the internet and, and, and also have the capability to assess the claims of new energy inventors as they said, I have the next great mousetrap. Well, an organization called New Energy Congress, which is a, a sister organization to New Energy Movement, has been established that does just that. So if you go to, to newenergycongress.org and you click on the top 100, you can view a database that has all these different technologies on there. It has, has interviews with the inventor, has you know, uh, video demonstrations of the technology, has critiques of it, uh, all kinds of projections for it. It's really been a, a, a great, great asset to what we're trying to do. And it's been getting a lot of visibility. In fact, even we, we've had the, uh, the U.S. Navy, it actually contacted us and said, said you know, uh, in our, our uh, Department of Energy Assessment in the Navy, we, uh, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out how do we put together a, a database so that all of us know what each other's working on. And then someone said, well, God, you got to take a look at what these guys are doing. And, and they're, they're like, you're already there. Can we partner with you on this? Well, the reception to that request for partnership, which came as a, uh, an unofficial solicitation uh, from a particular captain, uh, we uh, uh, talked about it within the group on, on the Congress, and there's about 50, uh, 50 of us who have some background in, in new energy, mostly from the science community, uh, but folks who have been doing something related to new energy for a long time. 
So we talked about this, and it was vigorous. And there had been some who were inventors among our groups who had had government contracts, some of the military, who thought, you know, this might be a good idea. Then there were some others uh, in that same fraternity who'd had not so good experiences, and then quite a few others of us who, who have seen uh, some obstructionism come about from government agencies where when we added up all the votes, it was, no, we're not, sorry, we're not going to partner with the U.S. military on this. We're just outside our comfort level, but good luck with your database. So I have a lot, actually, I, I have a lot of, of family who are in the military circles, and, uh, and I have a lot of respect for our, our government workers in all sectors who are conscientious and trying to do the best job they can uh, where their responsibilities lie. So it, if it t sounds at times like I'm taking pot shots, it's simply uh, to point out where there has been gross negligence or some very willful intentional obstruction. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. Sterling Allen is the, uh, is the brain behind New Energy Congress. And he does the, the editing, the moderating, and uh, you know, it, it does a fabulous job of keeping this thing updated and linking it up to some of his, his uh, online news service. So if you were to look at that top 100 on the newenergycongress.org website, you'd see all different kinds of technologies. Uh, many of these would be in the, the realm of what we call the, the conventional renewables, like solar and wind, uh, geothermal, uh, biofuels, things like that. But then there's also quite a number that are in the other category where where we have our emphasis at New Energy Movement, which are the real breakthrough quantum leap type of stuff. So you can see there's just all kinds of things on there. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at it and, and learn some of that. <clears throat> so we talked about some of the technological stuff here. And we also talked a little bit about uh, what some of the obstructions have been. Well, we also needed to consider how do we impact policy? How do we actually get our government to focus in the right direction? Especially in light of the fact that we are spending so many billions, and in the case of Iraq, hundreds of billions of dollars of money out of your wallet, yours, yours, mine, all of us here, for what? And tell me it had nothing to do with energy. You know, if we took a fraction of that, a small fraction of that, and allocated it to the research and development of these breakthrough technologies, we probably would have, have no need to project U.S. military force anywhere on this planet. That's, that's my feeling. So there's lots of benefits that that come around this. So I guess we're looking at about this time last year, Brian O'Leary had, had approached me and said, Joel, I've been working on this, uh, this idea for some new energy legislation. Uh, one of the U.S. congressmen had approached Brian, it was uh, uh, Congressman Kucinich of Ohio, and said, look, can you craft a piece of legislation for new energy. And Brian took it on, said, yeah, we'll, we'll try our best to come up with something. So Brian called me and asked me if I'd come down to Ecuador where he lives. And last November, we got together down there and started to flesh this thing out. Then I, I took it on and, and kind of uh, probably took a month and a half, a dedicated time to to craft this piece of legislation that's, that's called the Energy Innovation Act of 2007. And it's back there on the, the table back there, and I encourage you to, uh, to take a copy uh, afterwards. The, uh, the Energy Innovation Act was something that uh, I had no experience in crafting public policy, but was willing to do. And it's one of those things that you never know what you can do till you, till you try it. But hopefully you have good mentors along the way so you don't make too many costly mistakes. Well, I had good mentors, 
and uh, Tom Vallone, who I mentioned earlier, who's uh, president of the Integrity Research Institute. He's also a patent examiner at the U.S. Patent Office in the Energy Division. Uh, Tom and Gene Manning, who uh, uh, Gene wrote a book called The Coming Energy Revolution. Uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman, tremendous networker, uh, involved all, all behind the scenes in new energy. Ken Rowan, here to, your, uh, to the left. Uh, Ken is probably the best science generalist that I've ever met. Uh, the guy has such an incredible wealth of knowledge that covers so many different, uh, different science uh, arenas. It's, it's amazing, and he's, he's been a tremendous value. Uh, just to note, uh, he's standing next to uh, Dr. Eugene Malov, who uh, uh, Eugene Malov was one of the true champions of new energy uh, up to the time of, of his uh, murder uh, just a couple months before our first conference. He was to be our keynote speaker at our first conference uh, when his life ended. Uh, so we dedicated the conference to Eugene's memory. Uh, he's 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 a real pioneer and a real hero. Well, what did we come up with on the Energy Innovation Act? These are the provisions in there. First, it established a new Office of Energy Innovation. We recognize that the, the Department of Energy has not been the, the place, despite its, its title, has not been the place to embrace new energy technologies largely because there's so much evidence that uh, the Department of Energy has obstructed new energy developments. You need only look at the whole cold fusion saga to find where, where there's been a heavy hand in suppressing cold fusion from the Department of Energy. And I can tell you this, cold fusion is real. I've seen it. I've met a number of, of the scientists who've been working in this. These are some of the most brilliant physicists on the planet. And uh, there are working experiments in cold fusion. In Portland, uh, Dr. John Dash, he routinely demonstrates his experiment that produces excess heat over and above what the input energy is to his experiment. I've also met with uh, Roger Stringham, who's uh, the pioneer of a process called Sono Fusion. Uh, I visited Roger on Kauai in February to see his Sono Fusion device, which is probably the most advanced cold fusion related technology right now. These are real. Ask these inventors if they've been able to get patent, and the answer is the same from all of them. Nope, not in the U.S. Not in the U.S. You just talked about Tom Malone being a patent examiner. Can you talk about that? Is, is he being helpful or obstructionist? Tom had uh, actually uh, some uh, interference of his own at, at the patent office. Um, he had worked there for a number of years and then uh, due to elements of his advocacy for cold fusion, he was removed from his position at the patent office. After a six-year arbitration, he won reinstatement with back pay. And part of that arbitration, the whole case, and that, that it's, a, it's public uh, domain to read his case demonstrated that there had been obstruction from the patent office for, against the cold fusion inventors. So uh, it's been it's just it's been one of these cases again where you know the the public I think knows and has a sensibility that this type of nonsense is going on. Well, it is it is, and we've got to have an end to this. So this Office of Energy Innovation is meant to establish something outside the Department of Energy who's, and, and have its charge is to get these breakthrough energy technologies out. Another provision is to establish an independent and publicly accountable citizen oversight council. And its charge would be the, to, to be the watchdog, to make sure that high ethics and principles are applied to the execution of this mission. It's, the, it's critical. We can't let this thing you know, just uh, go down a, a bureaucratic rat hole and have this revolving door between vested interest and, and government workers uh, that goes on in our military, in the FDA, uh, you know, and, and in virtually any other uh, big agency in the, in the government. <clears throat> uh, the, the act would also authorize appropriations of two and a quarter billion dollars a year for 10 years. 
and those appropriations would be in the form of, of small business innovative research grants and loan guarantees to the inventors or teams of inventors who demonstrate it through a very heavily vetted, uh, very heavily scrutinized uh, series of, of demonstrations and applications that they were technologies of merit, not some hokey pokey where some bogus technologies get through the gate. They would really have to demonstrate the goods and then they would get the funds. Now it's interesting, that two and a quarter billion dollars a year, compare that to uh, uh, what we're spending in Iraq, which is, which is this much, what, about every week? This is about what we're spending every week or less? This, this amounts to about five weeks of ExxonMobil profits? You know, we're talking on a per capita basis, $8 a year per U.S. citizen to fund something like this. So whenever I talk to citizens about this, they're like, sign me up. Here's a 20. Okay. But then when I've talked to members of Congress and the Senate about this, they're like, $2 billion? $2 billion? Well, that's, that's a lot of, oh, you, you won't, you, we can't. Yeah, give me a break. Give me a break. It seems like every other week there's an appropriation of another $100 billion to go into the Middle East. And it's not, but it's not about oil. Okay, the Office of Energy Innovation would have these critical mission tasks. First, to identify new and unconventional approaches to energy generation. That's the language that's, that is in the legislation. New and unconventional approaches to energy generation. And it defines very clearly what falls into that class. You're not going to find fossil fuels in there, even clean coal. You're not going to find wind or solar or biofuels in there because there already are markets and constituencies and, and commercial applications. There's already industry built around that. They, have, they already have, have funding available to them from the capital markets. These new type of technologies we're talking about have none of that, and we're trying to establish that. As I mentioned, there would be a, a rigorous vetting of these technologies to make sure that they are the real deal and that they are they merit this type of funding from our citizens purse and there also would be annual reporting that's required publicly viewable so the public gets to scrutinize their investment so you know it's it's something that goes beyond anything else that you'll find out there as far as accountability and also uh, an interesting incentive here is the establishment of regional research centers and incentives for collaborative work among research who, who are, are experimenting in similar areas. So for instance, you take a, the, the cold fusion guys, for instance. If you had cold fusion inventor A and cold fusion inventor B and, and they apply separately and they go through the gates separately, well, they would, only, they would qualify for, for, for so much of a grant. But if they agree to work collaboratively, they would qualify for a grant that is more than the, the additive of, of each of their individual grants. And that's to provide an incentive that recognizes the power of a brain trust among a tiger team of motivated researchers. So we want people to get out of their caves, out of their individual workspaces and laboratories, and come together, pool their ideas, and pull for each other for the best idea. Too easy uh, when we have a, a pet project, we think it's the world's greatest thing in the world. Uh, but, uh, and, and may not be very welcoming of, of criticism that, uh, that there are flaws in the, the technology. Well, we want to encourage people to, to check the egos at the door and go for what's best, fastest, most effective, safest, on and on and on. That helps us get the job done. So that's the motivation behind that collaboration. And then lastly, where the Department of Energy comes in is on the implementation side. So they do have a legitimate role to help speed along the implementation once the technologies are out there ready to go into the public domain. Steve Kaplan, who serves as our executive director, is, uh, has played a very vital role in, in 
helping us to set up the meetings with members of Congress. Uh, we, we had a five-week uh, uh, foray in, into Washington, D.C. in the halls of Congress uh, in January and February and connected with a lot of the legislative staffs of various senators and congressmen. And uh, it was a real powerful lesson for me. Uh, I had no experience in anything related to public policy. Steve has. He's got a long history. Uh, uh, he had worked for a, a senator some number of years ago and understands that world of Washington. Well, I was a bit dismayed, and maybe I was like a bowl in a china shop there, uh, you know, because I'm like, hey, <laughs> of course everyone wants this. Of course, every time I talk to a citizen group, everybody wants this. And you are the servants of the public, right? You want this, too, for your constituents. Oh, are you writing a check for my campaign? You know, that's, that's, it wasn't said like that. But it was very, very clear when you walked the halls of Congress, and I encourage each of you to, to have that experience at some time, because the doors are open to the citizens. I, I will definitely acknowledge and, and appreciate that. And you can go into any of their offices. And, and we did. Uh, and, uh, but I, I was dismayed at how the vested interests carry the day. One of the legislative aides for one of, one of these senators had said to me, you know, Joel, every day I've got an army of lobbyists from, from coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear power, and now from the solar power, wind power, and, and, and biofuels, all of these lobbyists are coming through here, and you guys are a gnat on the radar screen. You don't have any funding. You don't have a constituency. You know, you don't have a presence. You know, yes, this is nice that you got a piece of legislation. Yes, we'll read through it, see what you got, this kind of thing. But it, it was, that was pathetic. That was, it was, I mean, I appreciate his honesty, but uh, it, it was just very frustrating for someone who uh, thinks we got a good idea and thinks it's incredibly important and that it should be embraced. So uh, I guess my inclination was to go, well, power comes from the people. I'm going back to the people. Because clearly it's not happening here. And I did say this to, to several of the legislators is that, you know what, this is an opportunity for the United States of America. If we pass this, it's going to go somewhere else. And, and I've told every group that I've talked to since that time that take that legislation, and if you don't get reception from your own legislator in Congress, take it to your governor, to your state legislature, to your city council, send it to your friends who live in other countries. This, has a, this is a template for legislation on any level, from, the, from the, the local community all the way to the international level. And it should be used as such. And at this point, it may very well be that it gets embraced in other lands besides the United States. Sad, but that just may be the reality of it. OK, I think this is, this is a natural break here. And then when we come back, we will talk about the idea of open sourcing breakthrough energy technologies. And I'll be very interested in your ideas along those lines. OK. All right. Everyone got stretched and ready to go for chapter two. What we're going to talk about here is a concept called open sourcing, because this is an idea that could really help us to finally break out some of these new energy technologies into the public domain. And after I go through this, we're going to have some maybe 20 minutes for questions and answers. Please accommodate uh, for that, that time. It's very important that I get feedback from you on this. So what's the best way to launch a breakthrough new energy technology? Many of the inventors that are working on these type of devices have a uh, have a limited understanding of what the opportunities might be for launching this, and especially to have a successful launch of their technology into the public domain. Many of them do not have a good understanding of, of the, the blockades that have occurred through several different gates, whether it's been through uh, being denied financing or uh, being denied patent 
or uh, having uh, some type of heavy handedness uh, show up at your doorstep, which has happened, uh, or from the standpoint of having the business savvy itself to, to bring a tiger team around their technology so that it gets commercially launched. Uh, it's a, a whole different world from just inventing to actually having something that a consumer can purchase. Uh, so <laughs> there's a big gulf between those two. And being an inventor does not necessarily make you a good uh, business person. So the standard business model, which has been the only one that, that most have been aware of and embraced, uh, including new energy inventors, you know, th there's an invention that occurs, an idea, uh, a concept, a proof of principle, and then prototyping of that into something that, that uh, you know, looks like something you could demonstrate to a, a capital group. Might be venture capitalists, might be, be angel investors, might be members of your family who, who wonder why you've been spending all your time in your garage and just some smoke wisping out from under the door or something. But, but you demonstrate this prototype to your, uh, your funders and if they think you got something compelling, well, hopefully uh, they provide investment capital. Well, once, the, once the, uh, uh, that capital is provided, it's not for free. There's an exchange that's made. And generally, it has to do with licensing and uh, royalty arrangements uh, such that the, uh, the funder is going to get some portion of the, the proceeds, might be in, in controlling interest in a company that's birthed out of this technology. Uh, it might be some, some portion of, of royalties or, or other financial deals. Uh, and then the inventor himself often will settle for, for some royalty provision for himself. And uh, then normally a, a technology gets manufactured at some centralized location. And, and if it's a successful technology, it, you know, it, it goes out through pretty standard marketing and distribution channels. So that all is just kind of roughly outlines the standard business model. It's important to note that this model has not worked for new energy technologies. There's not one of you who can go down to your local big box store and buy a breakthrough energy technology. I, you know, I've seen a number of these things on the lab bench and, and demonstrations, but certainly none of them are anywhere near to where you can buy one at, at a normal consumer outlet. So what does the open source concept do that might change this picture so that these things become available in the public domain? Well, this first part here, the invention and prototyping, that part stays the same. What's different, though, is the whole approach toward patenting. In this case, with open source, there'd be no patents taken out on the technology because the inventor is not trying to protect intellectual property. He's trying to share intellectual property, as, in fact, as broadly and as rapidly as possible. Why, why do that? Well, it's because when you have the, uh, suddenly the, uh, the plans for how to build and operate your device widely disseminated across the planet, that detargets you. What's the point of trying to obstruct or suppress someone once the cat's out of the bag? You, you see? So, so there's great, great incentive to do that. Because a lot of the inventors who've experienced some obstruction, guess what? I mean, some of these guys who've had really heavy-handed tactics applied to them, they're, they're very paranoid. Many of them really are in fear and for their families and, and themselves. Well, that, that's really not a very fruitful position to be in if you're trying to, to focus and to do something that's going to uh, you know, provide a great boon to, to our whole civilization. So how do you get out from under that? Well, you know, this, is, this is one way to do that. You disseminate and you detarget yourself. But it does not mean that all these inventors who think they're going to be the next Bill Gates of free energy, it doesn't mean they're going to forego some financial reward from this. Because uh, when you have 
all of these technology, or, or you have your technology disseminated across a planet, all of the derivatives that will come out of that, all of the new technologies, all the desires to improve upon that technology, who do you think they would view as the number one consultant on the planet? It's going to be the inventor, the original inventor. That inventor will be under very high demand, if, if, if he or she wants to be, under extremely high demand to, to provide consulting services. And by the way, consultants can make a, a lot of money. Uh, and also, they'll, they'll uh, be invited to be on boards of directors of all different types of companies. You know, they'll be considered, uh, uh, this will add, lend to that company's prestige to have the inventor on their board, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all kinds of ways. He'll be able to write books, become Oprah's best friend. I mean, you name it. There's all kinds of ways that they'll be able to make money on this. But it's really important here that ideas are strengthened as they're shared, right? So this is a great way to share the idea. So you have a simultaneous wide broadcast dissemination of, of uh, the information through, um, through uh, press conferences. And those might be in you know, all key cities. It might be LA, Toronto, uh, London, Tokyo, you know, et cetera. And you have them all go off at the same time. And concurrent with that is the launch of the, the, the how to build plans across the internet, goes to every academic institution, goes to every civic organization, goes to every science foundation, goes to every religious organization, on and on and on. So it literally goes out to millions of people uh, within light speed. And so now people have this in their hands. When, when you consider the patent issue here, you know, I've heard people say, well, you gotta have, you gotta have a patent. You gotta have a patent, you gotta protect the intellectual property, because this is nonsense. Open sourcing's nonsense. All right, and, and just the idea of not being able to get a patent just really uh, is totally out of the box of a lot of inventors. But then I point out that, guess what? There's no guarantee you're going to be granted a patent. In fact, at least in the United States, if you have something that really works, the better odds are that you aren't gonna get one. And you look at the cold fusion guys, it's been like that. And it's been the case in so many other arenas as well. Or somebody will figure out a way to do it without violating your patent. Well, what ends up happening for what ends up happening to a lot of these technologies that have been denied patent is that there's a a certain provision in the National Security Act that was enacted back, I believe, in the nineteen fifties. Uh, that is a Section 181. It's a section, uh, section 181. It's a national security gag order. And what that means is that if you have a tech, you invented a technology that has applications or implications for our national security, the Commerce Department and the military can come in and, and take that from you, slap a gag order on you, which means if you disclose anything about this at all, including that you've been given a Section 181, you're under fine of $10,000, 10 years imprisonment. Now, that's a powerful dis disincentive for someone to launch their technology if, if they're going to be intimidated like that or possibly imprisoned. All right? That has kept a lot of technologies off the market. Now, some of those technologies then get sequestered into black budget programs. You know, and that's, that's, no, that's not surprising. This audience understands that that happens. So the whole patent route is a real hurdle. It's a very, very easy opportunity for obstructionists to, to put, to slam down the gate right there. In, in the general industry community, as a rule, a patent is considered a license to steal to begin with. Yeah. Now, the way most companies get around that is by using proprietary processes, which could apply here as well. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, well, why, why else should you open source instead of doing the normal patent route? Well, the patent process usually is very slow. It, it's, it, it doesn't happen within a year. It takes several years often, and the more, uh, uh, the, the more exotic or the more compelling the technology, which certainly would be the case with any technology that is, is uh, tapping into new forms of physics, certainly if it's showing excess energy output 
from what the measurable input is, that's, that, will, that freaks out mainstream science. All right? because, because they think that that violates the second law of thermodynamics. It doesn't violate anything. The fact of the matter is that just because we our, our science right now is not good at measuring certain types of input energy that can be transformed into electricity, that does not mean that that input energy does not exist. That is so arrogant to think that, that we invented the laws of physics. And, and when scientists, I am a scientist, in fact, my degree is in applied science. When scientists become unscientific, that type of hypocrisy is maddening to me. All right? It's like, no, you got to follow, you're going to follow the scientific method, you go to the data. You go to the data, you look at the reproducibility of that data, and you put your dogma aside. Okay? I think it's good to acknowledge, and I think maybe everybody agrees, that the patenting process does hamper the propagation of ideas. Most definitely. Okay, what else? Well, given the acute challenges we have on our planet, whether they're environmental, geopolitical, socioeconomic, we don't have a lot of time to wait around for this. Every, every week or month that can be saved by getting something out into the public domain more quickly is an advantage for the, the whole civilization. So open sourcing facilitates a more compressed time frame for implementation. Open sourcing also taps into the vital brain trust of millions of people who could take that technology, improve upon it, derivatize it, launch all types of, of new complementary technologies or, or other derivatives that, that would result in a huge new economic boom. I mean, look what happened you know, in the, the whole Silicon Valley situation here. You know, we had, we had untold numbers of new jobs created, new wealth created through that, that whole revolution through, through high tech. It's amazing. This will make that look small. This will make that look small. But the nice thing is about it, this can be used to remediate existing problems, environmental, geopolitical, resource depletion, et cetera. So not only will it result in a great economic boon, but it can help, help repair the damage that's been done as well. A lot of the explosion on the internet was because of open sourcing. Yes, sir. You're exactly right. You're you. exactly right. The high-tech industry has led this wave in open sourcing. Well, I have this, a question. Um, I really like open source. I mean, totally. But a lot of these technologies you're talking about require a huge investment of money. Like, I could sit down and think of experiments and spend $100,000 just buying the equipment to set the thing up and say, okay, here's without patents, which is historically what investors are, I mean, to even corroborate this, I looked at your guys' website, and it's fantastic, by the way. I advise everybody to go and check out the Congress and the other stuff you guys have done. They kept saying, okay, this guy's got five patents on his stuff. And I'd read another and say, okay, he's got six patents. And, and I'm thinking, I pulled my hair out of the patent office. I'm never going to go there again. Yep. I'm done with it. Right. But, how do you channel all this necessary investment in this huge infrastructure of, of just material resources to do like coal fusion? Well, they're in the university, they're getting grants, so that's cool. But what about the guy in the garage? He's just saying, you know, this really good idea, but you know, if I give it away, what do I got? Most most of these most of these grants for new energy technology of these of the genre I'm talking about here have not come from government or from universities. They've come from private sources. Uh, because mainstream science has an extreme bias against these, these technologies that appear to violate that sacred cow second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so, so that, yeah, they, th this is a law. Well, you can't, I mean, in the patent office it said, there shall be nothing that smacks a perpetual motion, right? Well, we're not talking about perpetual motion. We're talking about new energy, tapping sources that we have not known how to tap nor measure before, translating that into a measurable and usable output called electricity or mechanical motion. All right. So as far as the funding itself goes, 
we've looked at this and have had input on this from the inventor side and some others who've analyzed this. You'd be surprised at what $10 million could do for, for an invention. Like a, a Roger Stringham in, in Kauai, what he could do with $10 million to take Sonofusion to market, huge, huge leverage there. Any, and, and look at the, the, uh, the Energy Innovation Act, calls for that two and a quarter billion dollars. That's $10 million a year toward each of 200 technologies. That, you know, that's huge, and that's each year. That's huge leverage. Huge, and only one of them has to work. You only get one of those out of there. What a deal that was. You see, we, we have to kind of reorient funding priorities. We're spending hundreds of billions of dollars to devastate another country and its citizens. We're spending that. We are spending that. We're tolerating that. We could be spending a fraction of that to heal this whole situation. And we will. That's a political problem, isn't it? It's our problem. Yeah. It's our problem. It's not somebody else's. So, well, let me go on because we'll have some dedicated time for questions here. Okay, if we get people excited, feeling they have a hands-on investment that they can make, something they're enthused about, that becomes that that energy results in a lot more idea sharing. And people, people get really enthused about that. Look at all the, the, the big things that are going on, that, uh, whether it's climate change or you know, these wars going on or, or uh, you know, y any of these scandals. People feel like, ah, and they want to retreat. Is it any wonder why we have so many people who are, they, they plug themselves into mindless distraction in, in you know, TV or video games or, or, or destructive behavioral impulses of, of, of any sort, you know, it's because they're looking for an escape. This seems so overwhelming because they feel like they don't make a difference. You suddenly give them a stake in something they know is huge and will make a difference. Wow, watch the excitement that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. Holy cow, you won't be able to contain that. That's viral in a good way. The, the standard business model is very vulnerable to obstructions at several different gates, whether it's, whether it's at the patent phase, whether it's at the funding phase, um, whether it's, it's at the, the business team phase. There's all kinds of ways to sabotage those efforts. That happens all the time in, in standard technology. There's all kinds of shenanigans that go on all the time, even, not, not even talking about new energy. That stuff happens all the time. But you put it with something so highly leveraged as what we're talking about here, the single most disruptive technology that's ever been launched on this planet. Watch the vested interests come out like a pack of wolves instead of in, in individual jackals here and there. You know, that's what we're talking about here. Look at the infrastructure that's being built to keep that oil pipeline going. Look at the number of lives of our soldiers that are being given to protect a resource that doesn't belong to this country. But those are our kids. And the mothers of the other kids in those lands who are dying, they bleed and cry, you know, just like our mothers do. And this is an emotional issue for me. Okay, well, open sourcing gives us an opportunity to do an end round. We run around this whole thing and just, you know, the, it, it's time for the fear to end. That's not why we're here. You know, we're not here to be paralyzed in fear and to distract ourselves from the heavy lifting that has to be done. That's why this is a grassroots thing. This is why we enlist everybody to share the idea and then go out and do something. Let's make this happen. It's our world. You know, these are our kids and, and grandkids who are going to inherit this. Well, guess what else is cool? We get one of these things out on the radar screen, and guess what? All these technologies that have been held back 
by different inventors for various reasons, maybe because they were waiting for their, their three to five years to get all their patents and they've spent, you know, you won't believe how, many, how much money it costs to patent and to, to pay all the legal fees for protecting patents. It's enormous. And I'm saying, put that money toward the technology. Get it going. Put it toward the, the public launch of this and open sourcing. Don't, don't send, you know, a bunch of attorney's kids to college. You know, let's, let's, let's get something going so everyone can have the benefit of a great education. All right? So you break one of these free, there'll be a mad dash to be second. Everyone, the floodgates are just going to open. And it's going to be like, holy cow, what's going on? It's just going to be coming from all over the place. What an exciting time to be alive. You watch college courses start popping up now. It's going to be, you know, new energy engineer. It, it, it's it's going to be you know uh, all different types of, of curriculum changes so that so that people can get educated on how to deploy this stuff in a way that transforms this planet. Awesome stuff. And then this is this is something that when I see some detractors of the open source, they go they go, your head's in the clouds. You got to go the standard business route. It's the only thing that, that'll work. And then I say, no, oh, you've got no track record for what we're talking about. There is no precedent for launching a new energy technology using the standard business model. What precedent does exist is obstruction all along the way using that model. It has not worked, period. And it hasn't worked for, for, for decades. It's time for something new. It's time to use that, that open source model that facilitates uh, the, the launch through the internet. It's, it's marrying up this, this synchronistic, pregnant time between the power of the web and the power of these new technologies. The time is no accident. They're meant to be used together. So to me, it's like, here, here it is. We should not squander this opportunity. This is about freedom. Freedom, 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 period. Patents, if taken out, and everyone said, Joel, shut the heck up. This open sourcing thing isn't, isn't going to work. We're going to do the patent route. Okay, so let's say, let's say uh, Mr. New Energy Inventor from the United States gets his, globe, his global patents, all right? Well, guess what? If you are in India and you have a family of 10 and you live in a village that has no electricity and you don't have clean water and uh, your kids uh, you know, have no chance at all to, to have a, a, an education, and then someone comes to your village with, uh, with one of these American-made uh, new energy inventions. And uh, you pull together your count, the council of elders in your village. And you know you can't pay $1,000 for that device. There's no way. Your whole village couldn't raise that amount of money for it. But you have, you have a couple of very clever young people in your village who know how to tear something apart and put it back together and make it work. You think that the patent's going to be enforceable in countries where people are dying for basic necessities? They, it's so easy to establish a moral prerogative that preempts anything to do with intellectual property protection because we're talking about the lives of human beings. You can't enforce that. And if you try to, that government, a government that tries to enforce that should be booted out, period. Because they've lost all perspective. All perspective. Others have said, well, uh, 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 you know, this whole open source thing doesn't allow you to have a controlled rollout. You got to have a controlled rollout because all hell might break loose. You know, we things are going to happen that we're not going to be able to control. Give me a break. You're not going to be able to control it anyway. We just went through the exercise here that any of these technologies that are launched, 
even if they have patents on them, they're not going to be enforceable. They're going to be copied. You think China is going to go, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll make sure our citizens pay royalties for all these. Oh, my, my God, on day two, the thing will be copied and pirated and, and sent out, which from our standpoint, that's great because that disseminates it and helps make a dent in, in what we're trying to correct here. So, you know, this controlled rollout is a fantasy. There is no such thing. And anyway, who would be the arbiters of a rollout? Who are the wise ones who really know how to do this? And who really has no vested interest in this? You know, I would rather put the power to the people and let it rise up from the grassroots. New wine should not be put in old bottles. For very good reason, those bottles will rupture. They can't contain what's new and expansive. So using the new method of open sourcing, using the power of the internet, is the right thing to do with this. That's what I had to say about open sourcing. We're going to wrap this up here. You know, from the, the new, energy mission, new Energy Movement mission statement, we envision a world of clean, safe, abundant, inexpensive energy for all. Clean and healthy water, food, and air. Low impact, sustainable forestry and agriculture. Recycling of virtually all wastes. Rivers running free and natural. Thriving, sustainable local economies. Living standards and education rates increasing. Birth rates declining. A global culture of sharing. Unleashed human creativity a new and lasting era of world peace. That's what we envision, and it's within our grasp. We just have to make up our minds that we'll accept nothing less. We need your help. We are a, a nonprofit. We are staffed by all volunteers, all of which have other jobs that, that pay our bills. Uh, we operate very lean. If you think that this message has value, we ask your support to help us get it out in a much larger way. Uh, I try to, to make as many of these opportunities as I possibly can. In fact, I told my, I have a day job, I've told uh, uh, folks in, in the company I work for that if ever there is a high leverage opportunity where I have to choose between the, my new energy movement passion versus my day job, I said, i just let you know now, I'm going to the passion. So let's be square. And they're like, okay. They, they acknowledge that and uh, accept that, and I, I appreciate that. So anyway, there's many ways to get involved. Uh, you could support us with your, your time spreading the word. You could support us financially, which would be wonderful. You can connect us with benefactors who would resonate with this message. We want to do some big things here, and, and we'd love to be able to talk to thousands and thousands of people and have this, have this thing just spread and not be able to be contained. Also, for your legislators, uh, please talk to them and insist that they support new energy legislation, not just the conventional renewables, but breakthrough stuff, and that means they need to get educated on it. Yes, yes, yes. If you go to the New Energy Movement website, newenergymovement.org, you go on the home page there, uh, the Energy Innovation Act of 2007 is a link on the, uh, on the right. So, with a revolution in energy as the foundation of a renewed and loving stewardship of our planet, we can transform this world into a beautiful and healthy home full of promise, opportunity, abundance, and peace for all humanity. And I thank you all for providing me the privilege to speak to you on this. And I hope that we have a chance to speak again. Thank you very much. We have time for questions? Good, good. Can I get a drink of water here real, real quick first? Not a while. <laughs> How much you want to pay? <laughs> do you have the energy to do it? <laughs> so, so, Joel, I'm going to throw out the first question. Does Al Gore know about what you're up to? <laughs> Does Al Bill Gore, Gates know what you're up to? Well, Al Gore, actually, we have an open letter to Al Gore on our website. 
that letter was written by Brian O'Leary and was uh, taken to Al Gore. Uh, we don't know, well, we've not heard any official response from him. One of our volunteers up in uh, the Portland area went through the, uh, the Al Gore uh, climate change workshop and had some one-on-one -on -one time with him. I've not met him directly myself, but um, you know, we'd like to think that he's supportive of this. But he also is under a barrage of all types of people trying to, to take his time. One thing that uh, you know, we need to acknowledge is that not everybody is quite on board with what we're talking about here. Because we are talking about something hugely disruptive. Hugely disruptive. And many of our heroes have vested interests as well. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. A uh, question. You're really preaching to the choir, I think, to a large extent, mm -hmm. to this open source world. I'll take, I'll, I'll take who comes. <laughs> <laughs> but we're in a transition period between what you're envisioning and what we have today. We have venture capitalist angels starting up in that right. How do we provide them some kind of business model that can help them reimburse to the levels they're after 20, 25, 50%, 100% returns without patents and the normal structure? Well, Is there a business model that's been envisioned to do that? It's a good question for me. And I, I'm glad that, that you brought that up. Because here's my gut reaction to that. Our planet's at stake. Our planet's at stake. If you have the resources to make a change on this planet that launches a new era, to be concerned about whether your return is 25 or 50 or 100, that, that is, we're in different rooms. Right. We're in different rooms. The, the, the benefactors who will step forward for the open source model are those who resonate with the urgency and the importance of what needs to take place. And their focus will be on getting the job done right and not to, to be the one out there waving their own banner on this. They'll know what they did and that'll be good enough. And you know, it's, it's, I, I liken it to, you know, the, the executive director of this library wasn't here when I gave him accolades early. But he's the type of man who is an angel behind the scenes, and he never asked for anything in return. He just, he's like, thank God, thank God there's someone here to do something. I'll help that. Thank God there's someone here to do something. I'll help that. That's an angel. I don't, you know, the venture capital thing, you know, I, I don't, we're just we're in a, a bit of a disconnect. I agree, but, but this, these are the transition periods we're going to have to look at. And, and uh, I, I can I can I can say this that I am in favor of all approaches. The open source is one approach. I happen to think it's the one that's likely to work. The standard business model. I hope there's a thousand attempts at that again and continue to be so that some spaghetti sticks on the wall. If we throw enough of it, no matter what approach, there, there's others. Someone asked me earlier about. Uh, uh, Steve Greer, who some of you, you may know. Steve also has a, a compelling interest and program to help launch new energy technologies. It, it, it more rests on, on, on him being a very visible uh, champion, marshalling it along by force of personality and connections and things like that. It, and, and maybe that way will work too. But I'm not, I'm not willing to, to, uh, to put my bet on any one approach. Let's try them all. We need, we need something to work and work soon. Yes, sir. Well, we have a new technology that actually qualifies here. It's a waste energy technology. And that our goal, and it's a transition piece, because I recognize completely from the beginning what you're saying. Yeah. That it's only going to, you know, the waste energy piece will be a piece of it, but it needs what you're talking about. Our goal all along has been that when the money starts coming in from that, we want to fund exactly what you're talking awesome. about. Awesome. So my question is, if, if you get the funding for that, then 
part of funding whoever the scientists are, is it a condition of that going to be that they are willing to open source? That's something that we want to be the case, yes. And there's, there's hybrids of the open source model that we didn't talk about because it's, you know, there's nuances there. But the idea, the, I mean, the main idea would be open source. And, and what we will do is have the, the funds to provide material support and, of course, you know, development funds to get the thing going, but also to provide material support for the inventor. You know, he's, this, is, this is what he or she is, is doing, and they should be compensated for that. It's not a guarantee of millions and millions of dollars for them, but it's that their, their needs will be comfortably met and because we recognize what they're doing. Certainly, they should be you know, provided for you know, at least the, the, uh, uh, to the level of what a, a, an industrial uh, scientist would be or a mainstream academic scientist. But a lot of these inventors are living you know, hand to mouth. And they're just, they just scrap for they scrap for any little bit of funding they can get, and and that makes that leaves someone very vulnerable to be taken advantage of. Yes, sir. I'm I'm all I'm really excited with the open sourcing thing. I'm curious why you're here. I, I hear you talking about high leverage, and I feel like you why why are why are you talking to us rather than scientists who are making the decision about which route to go? Open sourcing. Well, I do both. Okay. I do well, both. Why are you here? What, what why am I here? I'm, I'm, I'm here because he, you guys have a, a huge stake in this. We're a, gra we're a grassroots organization. We rec you know, I've been in the halls of Congress trying to rattle things there, and guess what? The reception uh, or the hearing <laughs> or something is not very acute. Citizens get this. They get this, they get this, they get this. You know, if the citizens made enough noise to the constituents made enough noise to their legislators and said, if you don't get on board with this, I I'm not voting for you. Period. Yeah, they listen to that. They listen to and that. And also, he was invited here by the person who founded this library. Right. Yeah, Jordan. Yes, ma'am. I lived in the state of Hawaii, which is an isolated state. Um, and the interest in alternative energies has been strong there, certainly since I was um, living there in the, in the 70s. I was wondering, since you mentioned Kauai, yes. uh, if you had explored at all what, what has been happening, what the philosophy is in the state of Hawaii, and also about the state of California, um, because there does seem at least to be some talk about California being more acutely aware of the problems of global warming and so on. Do you think that's just talk, or do you think there is some, maybe some interest in your in your movement down there? I, I as don't well know. As in Hawaii? Because I think we have to get away from this this thinking that we can expect the central government to do anything at all. I really don't think it's going to. I think it's going yes. to come from the grassroots, it, and probably yes. from individual states. And so on. I think that's more realistic. I think I so think you you're. I, I think I, I think you make a great point there that it's likely to come from the grassroots. It's likely to come from pockets of progressiveness, which certainly California, Hawaii, and Southern Oregon have that element to it. It's likely to spring up in areas of the world where people are, you know aren't numb because they're indulging in all this, this uh, mind-deadening uh, distraction. Because they're like, they're in survival mode. And they may not have all the obstruction layers that we have here. You know how many, how many the layers of legality we have on top of us? That, that, you know, all these manipulations that could be applied to cut you off or intimidate you in so many different areas, whether it's from the IRS or the Homeland Security or, you know, you name it. We've got such a pile on top of us. And a lot of other places don't have that, you know. You look, look at what happens in, in Latin America. This is something that Brian O'Leary says to me since he lives in Ecuador. He says, you know what, if, if, what's, if what's been going on in the United States and all the nonsense and scandals, corruption, and the whole war, war thing, and essentially the depletion of our national treasure to, to be over in the Middle East. 
says, if this was any of the Latin American countries, there'd be millions of people in the streets every day and not leave till that government was out. But the United States are watching American Idol. I, I don't mean to pick on them, maybe it's something else, but you know what I'm saying. You make a great, you make a great point. Yes. Last year, we saw El Gore's movie and walked out of it, and two days later, we're blessed with this knowledge of a technology that was going nowhere. That is what you're talking about. And um, looked at each other and said, we have no idea, we, my, our, his, our backgrounds are not in this. We, let's just do it. Let's just create a business around this. One year later, we are almost at the point where we are launching a multi-million dollar business that will be successful with very little money and a hell of a lot of work for one year. Because we thought, why not? Let's do it. Awesome. And it is happening. And it will happen. We're just very clear. We have had angels and, and synchronicities that I can't even believe have happened along the way that we're just like, this is meant to be. When you put yourself out there and you try things that you know nothing about, I mean, clearly, we, we've just been guided and gifted, and, and it just continues. And what that's and that's good news. What business is that? This is transferring, transforming waste to energy. It's yeah. taking garbage, our biggest problem, and turning it into an asset. And that is really, you know, we spent years doing healing work on ourselves and on, you know, our loved ones and realized that this is what we're now being guided to do for the planet. Our garbage is not garbage. It's going to be turned to energy. It's a resource. Anyway. That's a it's resource. a resource. And this is, you know, this is what we're learning as a human population, not just, you know, this, this is a huge message yeah. on many levels. The new mines are in our landfills. Totally. And, this and, this and, is and great, this is great a, news. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're sharing this. It was patented before we got involved. Yeah. And we are, and Jeff has been incredible in finding new ways to work the business model. And our vision is to, I mean, there's going to be so much money here. Our vision is to share this in the same way you are. And we are going to create a, a model where people can come to us and get money. Great vision. And do this and keep doing it. And it's, and we're also setting it up in a way that big business is going to benefit from this, not want to squash us. Because it's it's a it's a transitional technology that is it's huge, and it's and it's going to ev it's a win 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 on every single level, That's including great. big business. That's great. So we are so excited about it, and we feel so humbled and blessed that you know our our friend our partner in this has sort of said the David and Goliath um, you know metaphor because that's how he looks at it, but it really feels that way. And, and we just continue to, so I believe that we'll be hooked up with you because we oh, have the same thank vision. You. Well, I appreciate and, uh, that. And this is, I, I'm yeah. really glad you shared the vision, not just the vision, you're making it happen. And we that's, are. And that's yeah. all the more power to you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that idea, too. Yes, ma'am. Are, are you speaking to big seminars at universities? Are they inviting you? Uh, I have spoken at a number of conferences that uh, but I've not been invited to a university to speak to, like faculty, and like to break into that. Part of part of what's been uh, a real challenge for us is because we all are we we all have full time day jobs. In mine, I travel internationally a lot. It does not leave a lot of time for me to do anything but work new energy movement in the cracks of my time. That's that's what's allocated because you know I I need to feed my family. So uh, it will be wonderful when we are, we are blessed with the benefactors who will allow me to have a full-time paid staff so that they can focus on, on doing this and doing it in a much more you know, highly leveraged way. I would love nothing more than to go and, and start talking at universities. In fact, a woman who was here earlier extended the invitation for me to come and talk to her high school class uh, sometime tomorrow uh, or, or uh, Thursday, which would be, I would love to do that. It's one of the things we have on there is, is education uh, of, our, of yeah. our young people. They're so going to be love their to world. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Thank you so much. It's been great. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer-operated federal 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. 
Material and monetary contributions are fully tax deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.